big question that I received this week. And first of all, before I do that, I want to shout out to Crazy Dustin, our new subscriber on YouTube. And he wasn't the only one, but some of you don't have your subscriptions public, and so I can't give a shout out. So if you make your subscriptions public, then I can go ahead and give you a shout out on the channel. But um, the question of the week here. Uh, or is more of a comment, a follow up on last week's Q and A, uh, and his uh, it was having to do with Seven Day Adventist and the idea of the scapegoat doctrine as taught by Ellen White, and Ellen White taught that ultimately the sins of the world would be placed upon Satan, who is uh, the scapegoat in the Old Testament, and so ultimately all of the sins of the world are not placed upon Jesus but upon Satan. And so here was his response. Adventists don't believe Satan is the author and finisher of our salvation. And so I went to the source, and that being the official Seventh-day Adventist website, and I found an article just by typing in scapegoat doctrine. Uh, I found an article that said, when sin will be no more. And so I'm going to read some of that to you and uh, just to show you out of the horse's mouth that this is not just something that was taught, but that, but that is being taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it says, When that small cloud finally appears on the horizon and Christ returns to this earth, he will not yet restore this planet to a sinless state. He will first destroy the ungodly, see Second Thessalonians 2, eight, and then take with him his living and resurrected children, you and me, I pray, to a safe haven of peace, a new Jerusalem, to watch the final sad unfolding of earth's history, see Revelation 24-6. This actually will be a story of decreation or a reversal of creation. After the planet has been depopulated by Christ's second coming, it will regress to its original desolate state, formless and void, as Jeremiah describes it in an eschatological vision during Old Testament times. See Jeremiah 4.23-25 and Genesis 1.2. But the most desolate scenario is drawn up for Satan the master tempter bound for a thousand years to a place in which no one is alive to tempt, is, which almost must be the ultimate penalty. See Revelation 20, verses 2 and 3. One thousand years is a long time to bear the sins of this world, which are being placed at this moment on Satan. This was symbolically portrayed in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, during which the sins of God's people were placed on Azazel, the scapegoat, before it was sent out into the desert to die. See Leviticus 16, 8, 21, and 22. At the end of this period of time, the millennium, the final showdown between good and evil, will take place. As the New Jerusalem descends from heaven, you and I might be watching from above as Satan tries to once more mobilize all his dark powers to lead them into a futile battle that, because of Calvary, is doomed to utter failure. No real war will occur. Instead, merciful fire from God will consume the remainder of sin in this universe and cleanse it for eternity. See Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. So, my friend, it is still being taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And yes, they do believe that Jesus did accomplish something on that cross, but it's not what Christianity has always taught, that it was the substitutionary atonement that satisfied the wrath of God and that sin was once and for all dealt with there on the cross. They believe that ultimately those sins are going to be placed on Satan as our scapegoats. And so, let's move on. Uh, I had another response to one of our questions last week. Uh, somebody I, I referred to as a Calvinist of sorts because he believes that some are saved, some are not. Some are given the Holy Spirit, some are not. And uh, so I referred to him as a Calvinist. And he says, I am by no definition a Calvinist, and I resent you trying to pigeonhole me as anything without knowing all I believe. Go to my channel and read what I've written. That is what I believe. Well, I went to his channel, and it doesn't say a thing. There was only one video that was actually posted, and it really did not say anything about what he believes. So I don't know what he's referring to. 
And he says, I take this scripture quite literally, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you dispute this in any way, that's your problem. And I don't dispute that. I believe that all scripture is God breathed. I take all of it. I, I take all of it seriously. I would just say, uh, not all of it is word for word literal, uh, but I do take it seriously. And there's nothing in that that passage that I would take issue with. But you cannot take one verse or two verses by themselves and just make up whatever you mean you believe those definitions to mean and then place that and bind it upon all the rest of Scripture. And so, um, yes, it does talk about predestination and being chosen and all of those different things, but that does not uh, mean a lot of times what different groups want to place on it. And so, I, I'm sorry uh, if I offended you by referring to you as a Calvinist, if that is not uh, what you believe. But please uh, clarify what it is that you actually do believe, um, because it's hard to, I, you know, you definitely believe in predestination, and you believe that you are elect, and you believe you're one of a kind, but uh, you say that there's others like you at the same time. You're kind of an enigma, because you won't tell me exactly what it is that you believe. So going on. Uh, this is Tim, a follow-up on that journey, uh, and just some more clarifiers. So, what's up, Tim? He says, my son and I went to his final Bible study with his ICOC disciples, as International Church of Christ. We shared grace with them and showed them how their church errs in doctrine, and they were not receptive. However, I did stump them a little on the discipleship program. They believe that you aren't saved until you are baptized, a doctrinal error that I believe present, prevents salvation, because you must trust in at least one of your own works, making yourself co-redeemer with Christ. Their program lasts several months and could last more than a year. During this time, the disciple person does not believe they are saved because they haven't been baptized. That's something that actually started way back with the Catholic Church um, back in the early days of Christianity because they were dealing with a problem of people who were turning you know, away and recanting uh, when the threat of persecution came by. And so they wanted to make sure that those who were in the church and calling themselves Christian were truly believers. And so that's, that's where catechism and that whole idea started. But um, I agree uh, that if you believe that baptism is essential for salvation, to withhold that from a person for a period of up to a year is really, uh, really bad. <laughs> so... Uh, so I asked them to show me a single example of even one person being discipled for an extended period of time before being baptized. The best they could show me was the Ethiopian eunuch who was baptized no more than a few hours after talking to Philip. After that, they admitted that no one was asked to wait for an extended period of time before being baptized. And any profession of faith was enough to be baptized in the first century. To my amazement, they continued to defend this practice even after admitting that it was not biblical. This proved to me that we can't change anyone's heart or mind. It's entirely up to the Holy Spirit, but we presented the truth. By the way, I love the new format. I'll keep an eye out for these Q&A videos. Well, keep an eye out for this one, Tim. And uh, I'm loving the, 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 the story of this journey between you and your son and your daughter and uh, coming out of the International Church of Christ. Uh, just awesome, awesome, awesome. Good news. And I'm glad to hear that you were able to plant some seeds there. And I hope they come to fruition. Next, uh, we have a comment on the 12 Tribes video saying, interesting, I've never heard of them before, and that's not uncommon. Um, had it not been for my personal encounter with them, I probably wouldn't have either, and they are not covered in a lot of the books that uh, deal with cults or a lot of the, the videos on YouTube or podcasts that have to do with cults, um, and uh, so that's one of the unique things about my book, or you can just check out that video as well. That book, by the way, is Sharing Jesus with the Colts, available on Amazon. It's paperback or Kindle, and uh, I would love it if you would pick up a copy and review it and let me know how you what you think. And so another comment from YouTube, I guess they don't know that Jesus is God, 
and the kingdom does not happen till after the tribulation equals Jesus, our king, to rule for a thousand years. And that was another comment in relation to the 12 tribes video. And yes, you were right. Um, they choose not to believe that. Uh, they reinterpret that. A lot of Christians do reinterpret the whole concept of the millennium. And so... Uh, and so at another YouTube at about 624, your mic is doing something strange. It kind of made a click and then it's a static for the rest of the video. We can still understand you thought though you thought you might want to know. And so thank you. Uh, those kind of comments are really helpful for me to be able to know when my equipment is not doing a good job. I think what was going on is I was recording a ton that night and you you warned me about the fact that sometimes when I do that, my uh, my computer gets fairly hot and the fan starts going. And I think that's what was going on and what you were hearing. Uh, but good to know that at least it wasn't totally lost. That was the 12 tries video as well. But please, if you experience those kind of technical difficulties on anything related to my channel, please let me know because um, I, I can many times address it and um, and you know, deal with that. So it's by my, been my experience that if a group has to say it's not a cult, it's probably a cult. I've never heard a Baptist church or a Calvary chapel or an assembly of God and manage its members is not a cult. I've heard Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and ICOC members say they pe uh, tell their people that they're um, not in a cult. Maybe they should listen their safety in a multitude of counsel. And I absolutely agree. If you have to defend yourself, especially in a, such a public way as your website, that you are not a cult, then there's something wrong. So good insights there. Another from YouTube, you missed the part. This is the 12 tribes again. You missed the part where they explicitly say they are not Christian. That if you want to practice Christianity, then you are not welcome to live with them. That Christianity is the whore of Babylon. That the Jesus of Christianity is a demon. That anyone who prays outside of their cult is praying to a demon. That anyone who receives the revelation from reading the scriptures outside of their cult is receiving it from a demon. That the Messiah is not part of the Godhead Trinity, but rather only a man like us. That Messiah showed us the way, and so now we must repeat his steps in order to be saved. That... Um, Reading people is the worst possible way it is justified because it will save their soul. That it is not possible for a 12 tribes member to lie because they are holy. So say whatever you need to people outside the cult so that they will join and be saved. Pathological liar training. But it's cool. You wouldn't have known any of this stuff unless you actually join. Everything changes once you're on the inside. Everything. Wow. Uh, so that's uh, a view from the inside, at least previously. So thank you for that. Um, I, you know, you have a hunch that that's the case. Uh, but the fact that they're using Christianity as a lure and the Bible as a lure to get people in and then once they're on the inside. Now, it, it's hard to say whether or not when they say that we are not Christian, whether that's like in the sense of like early Mormonism, where they were very definitive that we are not Christian, we're Mormon, uh, we're distinct, and we're different, that they're all wrong, and that we're, we're not one of them. But, uh, you know, it may be in that sense, but it may also be in a sense where they're just using a bait and switch and they're using the Bible and Christianity as a way to lure people into their trap. And then once they have them in their, their clutches, then they reveal to them who they truly are, uh, kind of that whole step program. So thank you. Thank you so much. I would love to hear more from you uh, as time goes by. Thank you for your comments. And so, last on YouTube, good program. Thank you. Please, can you look up Sundar Selvaraj Sadhu? He is from the Rick Joyner NAR, that's New Apostolic Reformation, equals people need to be warned about this man, equals hope you can help, equals I do really think it's a Jesuit RCC movement that covers most of the world, equals please look into it in God Jesus Bless you always. Amen. I definitely will, and you'll be hearing more on next week's Q&A on that. Um, so thank you for the heads up on that. I'm going to set this one to the side um, so that I remind myself that I need to go back and keep that um, there and do some more research. And so new likes on Facebook on the People the Free Gift page, Silak Zvoyesu. And Tyler Lane, hope I pronounced that right anyway. Um, so 
from Facebook, we've got, uh, is it available on audio too? That was a question in regards to my book. And no, it is not available as an audio book. And man, that would be intense to have it as an audio book. But the videos that I'm doing um, throughout the week are systematically working their way through the book. Now, I'm not going into everything. When I cover a section, you're going to get more out of the book than you would if you just watched that video. I, you know, I have to sell the book somehow and make my money back uh, from production costs. Uh, but I, I would say you're getting a good chunk of that. And over time, my plan is actually to go more and more in depth each time I go back through so that um, eventually you're going to be getting uh, beyond the book and then you're going to um, be getting material that's going to be uh, the seed for future books and spinoffs of the book that focus more in detail on maybe a particular tactic or maybe a particular aspect of you know what uh, makes a cult uh, definitely the scripture twisting and, and tactic two. I, I'm definitely have in mind to do something with that. And so if you have ideas of things that you think would be helpful to go more in depth into uh, a particular area of the book that I, I don't haven't covered yet, then please let me know. You can just put it in the comments um, and that cues me into what the interest level is on different things in different aspects. And so I definitely will get to that. Uh, but thank you for the, the, the request. And uh, so another from Facebook. This was a comment in the midst of a conversation that was going on between uh, Christians and Mormons. And uh, somebody asked them, please share biblically where Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. I'll be waiting. And then they go on to say, this question is a problem for Mormons but here is the deal. It is actually a bigger problem for non-LDS Christians. So this was a Mormon that was writing. It is called among theologians the problem of evil. For LDS, our view is that Satan has always existed and that God gave him freedom to choose and he, Satan, choose evil. God allows the possibility of evil because without allowing it, we could never truly be free. And I don't know what they think that's different um, from Christianity other than the part about Satan ha eternally existing. Uh, but then again, in Mormonism, everybody, including God, including us, including the previous gods, and you know, we all existed as intelligences, and then we became spirit children, and then we were given a body and sent to this earth, and then we can progress to become, you know, gods and all those things. And so that's where the whole idea of spirit brothers between Jesus and Lucifer being spirit brothers, but so are all of us. We are all spirit brothers of uh, children of Elohim, our Heavenly Father, uh, in this existence. And so that would be the distinction there between Christianity. And uh, of course, terminology differences, always they can mean something totally different by all of those things as well. The Christian view is that an all-knowing God created Satan from nothing for the express purpose of menacing the earth with evil. No, it is not. Uh, no, it is not. Uh, we believe also that uh, Lucifer was created as an angel of light. See Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, and uh, that he fell. He took a, a third of the angels in heaven with him and that he became evil. So everything that God created is good. Now, did God know that that was going to happen? Yes, absolutely. Did he know that we were going to sin? Absolutely. But he gave us choice for the very reason that you have said, that we can truly be free so that we can love God, choose to love God. And um, so you're wrong in what Christianity believes in setting up the problem. So it's already a straw man from this point. Which view is worse? Christians believe God created evil. Mormons believe he is totally righteous and has never created evil, but does allow evil. As for Jesus and Lucifer being brothers, we don't really believe that. Here is what we believe. Jesus has always been God. Lucifer has never been nor ever will be God. No, that is not what LDS believe. I'm sorry, but that is not what LDS believe. 
Jesus is a spirit child of Elohim, our Heavenly Father. He has progressed to be God. Now, whether you believe that happened in the pre-existence or after he died and was you know, raised, risen from the dead and his work on this earth was done, um, or it's happened even after he progressed after that. You know, there's Mormons that are all along that spectrum. But no, he has not always been God. That is not what LDS believe. And so if that's what you believe, then that's awesome because that actually reflects a biblical point of view but it does not reflect an LDS point of view. And Lucifer has never nor ever will be God. That is because his progression was stunted. When he rebelled, he was sent with his, uh, his, with his other spirit children that he convinced in Mormonism. They were sent to earth without bodies, therefore stunning their progression and uh, making it so that they can never ever reach that state. But... Um, so going on, number two, he says, both Lucifer, Jesus and Lucifer, and all people who have come or ever will to this earth receive spirit bodies from the Father. In that technical sense, they are brothers. Both are sons of God. See Job 1.6 and Job 2.1. Yeah, the sons of God, and when it talks about those in Job or Genesis, those are angels. Those are not spirit children. And I know that the, the LDS believe that they are, that, you know, angels and spirit children and humans and all that, that they're all intermingled, and that's not true, okay? Number three, Lucifer rebelled and turned away from God, so from a rash, relational sense, he cannot be regarded as a brother to anyone except his evil minions. Okay, and this goes into this weird uh, dichotomy in LDS between uh, when they say that we're all spirit children so in a sense that we're all children of God. But then they will turn around and say, once you have come into this life, unless you have made a decision to trust God and follow him and keep his covenants, then you cannot be a child of God. And so this very real weird sense because they, they want to differentiate and keep Jesus unique as the son of God and make sense out of those scriptures in the gospel, but then say that we're all children of God, but then at the same time say that only those who are following uh, God's plan of salvation, that they are children of God and will return back to Heavenly Father. So you got three separate definitions of uh, children of God, and they, they don't mesh together, in my opinion. And maybe if you're LDS, you, maybe you can help me understand how you feel like it does mesh together. And then he pointed to an article by an LDS person on uh, teaching how Mormonism has the upper hand when it comes to the problem of evil. But if he defines it the same way that you do, then you set up a straw man argument. And so then you can demolish it and show yourself superior. But uh, you didn't accurately represent Christianity. So that was kind of a long one. And so going on into Facebook, uh, nope, I read it when searching for truth. It is not there. Does the Book of Mormon agree with the Bible? Um, and that was that the video, the Q and A last time. Somebody saw the title. Does the Book of Mormon agree with the Bible? And they just said, "Nope." You know, I, I read it when I was searching for truth, and it's not there. So, thank you for those insights. I agree with you. Uh, from LinkedIn, uh, very interesting and informative. And that was in regards to the twelve tribes uh, video that I posted. And then uh, in a personal conversation, how do you recommend I go about witnessing to my Jewish friend? And I answered this person in person, but I thought you would all benefit. Uh, uh, in general, dialogue is the best way. And I, I think that there's nothing wrong if you are a Christian and they are Jewish just to broach the question when you feel like the Holy Spirit is leading you and it's appropriate. You know, I'm curious, what do you think about Jesus as the Messiah. And just to hear what they think and what they believe and where they're at with that. And their answer is going to be very telling. I definitely would recommend the Old Testament prophecies related to Jesus. And if you want a shortcut to that, just go through the book of Acts. And every time you see, you know, Peter or Paul or Stephen preaching, they just pull out tons and tons of Messianic prophecies. Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 are great places to take a, a Jewish person because it's kind of a, a one-stop shop 
um, of all those different things to have a good conversation about what is the Messiah and did Jesus meet that criteria and just to present them with the truth and then you can launch into the gospel from there. And th so that's what I would recommend, but do it in the course of dialogue and uh, in questions, follow up questions and getting them to think through the, for themselves, getting them to interpret the scriptures for themselves. And uh, just like I would anybody else, any of the groups that we normally talk about on this channel, but that's how I would, I would go about that. And so this is an email. This happens to be from Tim's daughter. Uh, follow, another follow-up to that whole conversation. Uh, thank you for sending that to me regarding to the, the link to the Q&A from last week uh, where I talked about that. The shout-outs to my dad and my brother. That was kind of cool. I actually said my name too, Lil. Um, and she says, I'm willing to bet that my dad and brother would be happy to do a three-way interview. And I need to do my research on Google Hangouts to be able to start having some of these guests that I'm running across. Some of you have been coming out of these groups and you've agreed to come on my, my channel and be interviewed. And uh, that's uh, just awesome that it's turning the corner that way. Uh, so I need to do my research. And if you have a recommendation, uh, if you've ever done like uh, internet uh, interviews, um, and you have a recommendation of a program and whether that's audio or video I would love to hear about it please put that in the comments down below and um, which do you do your interviews through phone calls or over a text system because either way I think I can help set that up I'm pretty good with organizing things like that so <laughs> that might be my answer to my question I didn't see that part initially do you do your videos like this weekly because I'd like to keep up with it well thank you for that, and it seems like I'm getting some positive feedback um, off of this format. I know it's been helpful for me because I can sort out the people who are really wanting a, a dialogue and they're really asking genuine questions, and those who are not, um, it helps to save time. It helps me to answer in a way that's voice, and you know, you can see me as I'm doing it and not just in text, which is very easily misunderstood. And it also puts out another video <laughs> for you guys to enjoy. And also, I think some of you are enjoying hearing the different types of conversations I have throughout the week and kind of the fruit of some of this uh, channel and what it produces and this ministry and what it produces. So, um, and I think some of you are getting help by hearing how I would answer a lot of these different questions that are having to do with a lot of different areas. And so I want to know what you have to say. If you have an insight into something that I talked about that I did not share, please share it with the rest of us. If you have a question, a follow-up question, maybe to the conversation involving you, or maybe uh, something that you have it came up as you were hearing me talk about these other questions, then please put them all in the comments down below. I choose some of them for the weekly Q&A, which you're watching right now, and uh, some of these will be taken for next week's Q&A. And so if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, give us a thumbs up on this video if you like the content for the day and share this with others who are endeavoring to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who were caught in religion. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.